Praise the Lord, everybody. Pastor Fields here. Certainly, another opportunity the Lord has granted us to come together, to go into his word, and I'm so happy about that. I love the word of God. His word brings correction, reproof, healing, deliverance. Whatever we need can always be found in the word of God. Thank you for joining me. Those of you here at Greater Refuge Temple of Washington, D.C. and Refuge Temple Annex there in the Bronx, New York, the people of God are coming together. And those of you in various places across this country and even in other parts of the world, thank you for your commitment, your faithfulness uh, to this Bible study. And I pray that the Lord blesses you again on this evening. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we, before we go into the Word of God. Father, we love you. You are so good, so kind, so patient with us, and we're so grateful, Lord, for this an opportunity yet again to come together to go into your Word so your Word can go into us. Bless us one by one, everyone that connects with us on tonight. Overshadow us with your power, your anointing, with your joy. Feed us today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you now. Uh, tonight I'm starting another series um, coming out of the book of Revelation. I'll be dealing with the seven churches of Asia Minor and um, the lesson frame or uh, the motto of this seven part series is a letter from Jesus. What if, what if Jesus wrote you a letter? What do you think the other would say to you? Or if a letter came directly from the throne uh, to your church, what do you think that letter would say? We're gonna talk about it. This is part one. So we know that there are seven churches of Asia Minor. We'll be in chapters 1 and 2, I would say chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation for the next seven weeks. Stick with me, stay with me as we go from church to church and we address uh, each issue or concern that the Lord Jesus had with his church. A letter from Jesus, part one. Uh, and if we would give it a title, um, it would be, it's not too late to fall in love again. Um, Revelation, tonight we're in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, a letter from Jesus. Um, and this is what you'll find there. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Write these things, saith that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. My Lord, this is the very first church that John addresses uh, on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, a letter from Jesus, part one, and my subtitle, It's Not Too Late to Fall in Love Again. Often, <clears throat> often during my meditations, uh, I think about how we view the church in comparison to how Jesus views the church. You might find that 
how we view the church and his view might be totally opposite. I should say, um, I should put it like this, how Jesus views his church. I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever prayed about the condition of the church or even the church you may attend? Are we really where we should be? Um, is the Lord pleased in what he sees when he looks in inside? Uh, this is a question that sparked uh, this particular series. And, I, and this is not the first time I've done this series. From time to time, the Lord leads me to come back to it. Uh, and just take a look, just take inventory. Uh, if Jesus sat down and wrote us a letter today, what do you think it would say? Hmm. So during this series, we're going to look at the letters that were written to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Um, if you looked on the map, Asia Minor, it would be Turkey today. Um, Jesus' words to the seven churches uh, during the first century or the church throughout that uh, history, um, it reveals the spiritual condition of, of God's church throughout history. Uh, and it, it explains pretty thoroughly how you can resist the pull of an error that is rapidly turning away from God. Mm-hmm. Chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation explain the history of the church, of God's church, where it has gone astray, and what we need to do about it. So the letters to the seven churches describe actual conditions in each church at the end of the first century A.D. However, I must say that the letters also a prophecy. They prophesy about the future, mm -hmm. the future of the seven churches. Listen, we're geographically arranged in sequence. Um, it was a mail route in Western Asia Minor. And uh, scholars realized that this sequence portrays seven errors of God's church. Seven errors of God's church, errors, E-R-A-S of God's church from the days of the apostles to the end of the age, end of the church age. Church conditions described in the letters prophetically describe conditions that would prevail in each successive era. So John addressed, uh, as you see, he addresses the book of Revelation to the seven churches. I'll take you there. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 says this, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So it indicates that the letters to each church were to be read in all of the churches. So another purpose for these letters is to convey universal lessons that describe and deal with universal human tendencies. Because no matter where you go, people are people. People are people. That's why, that's one reason why you shouldn't church hop. Because everywhere you go, people are people. There's no such thing as a perfect congregation. There's, I'm going to say it again. There's no such thing as a perfect congregation. Now, let me say this. If you go to a church and, you, and it is a perfect congregation, do not join it. Because once you join it, it won't be perfect anymore. We are the church. And people are people everywhere. No matter what church you go to, there are issues. We need to understand what these letters reveal about the errors of the church, especially today in this modern era, and how the lessons apply to us today. So the letters to the seven churches reveal the serious, it reveals a serious deviation from the New Testament apostolic standard of truth 
and righteousness. Now, I use that word apostolic again, and some people uh, get offended. I hear some preachers fight us and, and say things against us because we use that word apostolic, but the Bible says they continued in the apostolic doctrine. And it simply means that we are following the teachings of the apostles. Who did they follow? The teachings of Jesus. So when I say apostolic, I'm not talking about a new reformation or a new religion. I'm simply saying that we follow the teachings of the apostolic doctrine. This is what the apostles taught. They preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? This is why Paul told the church when he sat down with the elders of uh, the Ephesian church, he said, preach no other gospel. So here we are at the end of the book. We're in these seven letters, uh, the seven churches, and it reveals a serious deviation from the New Testament apostolic standard of truth and righteousness. It was occurring in some of these churches in Asia Minor. And John is writing on behalf of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he begins to write what the Lord shows him and tells him to write. Um, it is to rebuke compromise and sin. He is rebuking compromise and sin in his church. He is rebuking compromise and sin in the church. I'm going to say it one more time. He is rebuking compromise and sin in the church. And he's calling them to repent and return. Repent. He's not talking to sinners. He's talking to the church. Repent and return to their first love. So, first church is Ephesus, and we read those verses, chapter 2 of the book of Revelation, verses 1 through 7. I want to read it again. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, walketh in the midst of of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and that has tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first Love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of of the paradise of God. So we're in Ephesus tonight. Ephesus was the leading city, the leading city of Asia Minor, uh, but it was in a state of decline. The Ephesian church is symbolic of the apostolic era of the first and second centuries AD. And this church is commended for its works, had good preaching. They were enduring and serving uh, the early apostles. They were able to tell the difference between uh, someone who was really an apostle and someone who was really not. And we see this in verses 1 through 3. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden stand candlesticks. I'm sorry, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. And you know today everybody's an apostle. You can be 10 years old and go on Facebook and say, I'm apostle somebody. He says, I, you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. He writes to the angel of the church. Who is the angel of the church? The pastor. He does not overstep 
the pastor. He writes to the angel of the church. He goes to the door of the church. Hallelujah. The pastor or the angel of the church. He writes to them. Right? Let's now let's talk briefly about the the mystery of the seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks. Right? Um what is the meaning of the seven stars and the seven candlesticks? Well, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches or the pastors of, of these seven churches. And the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So the star uh, is the angel of the church, the pastor. The candlestick is the church. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand. Book of Revelation says, and the seven golden candlesticks. This is in chapter one. The seven stars are the angels and the seven churches. I'm sorry. The seven stars are the angels of the pastors of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Now, let's remember that the Lord Jesus, through the pen of John, he, he commends them because he says you're able to tell the difference from false teaching or from that apostle that says he's an apostle and you find him to be a liar. Uh, and he's commending them for this uh, because there had been those, just like today, uh, who had come in and said, I'm apostle so-and-so or I'm, I'm uh, prophet so-and-so uh, here. An apostle is someone who establishes, who, who starts works, uh, who plants works. Uh, that's one of the works of an apostle. Uh, it is a gift that God gives to the church. And there were those who were saying, I'm apostle so-and-so. And they found them to be liars. And one way they were able to discern uh, that they were being lied to uh, was simply because of what they were teaching. They were found to be false teachers. Uh, and there's so much false teaching today. Now, um, in order to understand this, is one word, discernment, uh, which, which seems to be, um, I want to use the word lacking, uh, but many are just not focusing on discernment. Uh, and the Bible talks about it in the last days, People will have itching ears, giving into doctrines of devils. Uh, but there are ways to discern. I, I want to share with you briefly an article that was written by uh, Brother Mark Bernard, and it deals with ways to discern false teaching. Um, because just because someone has a, a title doesn't mean that they're preaching or teaching the truth. Um, uh, Mr. Bernard, who was, who was a Bible teacher himself, he wrote an article about four ways to discern false teaching. And he says that false teaching follows this predictable road from obscurity to prominence. And it simply gains traction because it can make sense or it looks genuine at times. It, it combines uh, biblical sounding ideas uh, personal experience, and a dose of helplessness, right? And it, it, it is nothing new. Listen to what he writes. It is nothing new and has been with the church from the very beginning. Paul dealt with it in Coloss and Galatia. It is part of a spiritual leader's responsibility. To, responsibility. Now, this is why the letters are written to the angel of the church. It's your responsibility to assess such new teachings and to be on your guard and protect the flock. Um, I won't go there, but if you go to Acts 20 and 28, uh, it says this, it alludes to this. It is helpful to realize that all false teaching can be recognized by four common characteristics. Number one, false teaching claims to be solidly biblical, but then proof texts without careful exegesis. It doesn't carefully or rightly divide the word because the suspect doctrines are not clearly taught in the Bible. If you don't see it in the word, it's not true. If 
there's no reference in the word, then it's not of God right? It's not taught in the Bible. Their promoters often cite individual verses out of context. So it's twisting the word in order to prove its point. Often reading their personal opinions into a passage of scripture. We are not called to preach and teach our opinions. We are supposed to give them the word of God, the gospel. That's why Paul said, preach no other gospel. So they twist the word, they put in their own personal opinion into a passage of scripture instead of doing careful study of the text and understanding its context. They'll turn the passage uh, with unclear meanings to substantiate their claims, and when pressed, they use their experience or what they have seen to back up their claims, not scripture. Scripture proves scripture, not your experience, not your opinion. It is never good when someone uses experience to validate truth and not the word of God. Number two, he says false teachers claim to have authority and exaggerate their importance. False teachers or these apostles or these prophets, they claim to have authority and they exaggerate their importance. So Paul, and when he writes, Paul described one false theologian as taking his stand on visions he saw, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head. Go to Colossians for this, chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. I'm rushing through because I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm sure that I'll come back to this. Uh, some proponents of false teaching claim to be uh, or to have an apostolic anointing. So no one can say he or she is wrong. They hear God speak to them apart from scripture. Now, if God speaks to you, God is not going to speak against his own word or his own scripture. He's not going to contradict what he said. No. No. So why is it that all of so many, uh, I won't say all, so many of these prophets or apostles, they say things that are contrary to God's word, as if God is rewriting scripture. He says, I'm not a man that I should lie, neither the son of man that I should have to repent. Even if an angel comes down from heaven, right, preaching this gospel, if he's not, if he's not telling the truth, let him be a curse. This leads to an unwillingness to listen to correction or to be open to input from those who might question what they teach because they say, well, God told me to say this. God gave this to me. God told me to do this. God, God showed me all of these angels from Africa and told me to stand up here and tell you who to vote for. That's, that's demonic. All of that stuff. Uh, and then when you challenge it, uh, you're wrong, but there's nothing in the word of God that substantiates. This is your feeling. This is, and just because you say God said doesn't mean that it's true because it contradicts God's word. So number three, the false teachers claim to have authority and exaggerate their importance. Number four, proponents of false teaching appeal to non-biblical sources that they believe strengthen their position. So you step out of the Bible. You, they step outside of the word of God to pull literature in that does not substantiate scripture, but it substantiates what they're teaching. So when you hear appeals to practices by the early church fathers rather than scripture, so they'll just say, well, this is how they did it before. They, they read a history book or they read uh, what someone else wrote concerning it, but they did not start. Their foundation was not the word of God. So if contemporary theologians get quoted in support of one's doctrine while ignoring what other theologians have said in opposition to it, alarm bells should sound, name dropping, citing well-known leaders who support one's view should never replace the well-exegeted text. Nothing replaces the word of God. I don't care 
how famous that person is. I don't care how much money that person makes. God's word is always supreme above any man or woman's opinion or theological standpoint. It's got to be based on the word of God. And the fourth, false teaching, if unaddressed, can lead to divine discipline, which means if the pastor doesn't address it, God will step in and deal with it himself. Hallelujah. Listen to what Mr. Bernard writes. False teaching takes root in environments where leaders and people do not do careful study. An environment where people don't read or study the word of God. Where church leaders don't take their role of protecting the flock seriously. Sometimes personal friendships or an overdeveloped sense of loyalty to a church family hinders corrective action, but such a failure to protect God's redeemed ones from such dangers can result in divine discipline on the whole group. Now the whole church is going through. Jesus commended the church at Ephesus for discerning those who called themselves apostles and were not. However, when we get to Thyatira and we haven't gotten there yet, he threatened the churches at Thyatira and Pergamum with divine discipline if they ignored the faulty and dangerous theology in their fellowship. So we're not supposed to let lies live among our church environment. No heresy, no false teaching should live among us. Stick with the word of God. Those uh, who are not courageous enough to push away or throw away the falseness or the lying or that false teaching. We're not doing our job. Discipline will come. God will come in and discipline the house himself. So we need to do what we're supposed to do carefully and prayerfully and not allow people because of their title or how persuasive they are to just lay out things that are not according to the word of God. Now, uh, Ephesus, uh, they were a well-known church. They were a popular church. They were doing the work. Uh, it seemed like they had discernment. They were able to tell uh, false teaching from what uh, the truth really was. But here in verse 4, he says, but I, I have something against you, though. Uh, he commends them. Uh, he says, you haven't fainted. Uh, you've been patient. Uh, for my name's sake, you've been laboring, you know, you're well known in the community and you have not given up. But nevertheless, verse four, I have somewhat against thee because you have lost, you have left rather, you have left your first love. He, and he says, um, remember, therefore, from when you have fallen and repent, he's telling this church, he's telling his children to repent, 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 turn back to me. You, you have left your first love. You're not, you're not doing this for me anymore. You're not doing it because you love me. Lord, have mercy. You've left your first love. You mean you're busy? You're working? Selling dinners? Selling candy? We're working diligently in whatever area of the church, but you're not doing it for me anymore. You're not doing it because you love me. You have left your first love. And the Lord, he, he warns, unless you repent, I'll cease to use you for my glory. Hallelujah. You don't believe it? Let's go to verse 5. We just read verse four. Let's read verse five. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place. Now, remember, the candlestick represents the church, right? Seven candlesticks, seven churches, seven stars, seven pastors. But he said, if if you don't repent and turn back, mm -hmm, do the first works, fall in love with me again. Remember why you're doing this, who saved you. Remember your purpose. 
Hallelujah. I will come quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place, except you repent, except you turn back to me. I'm going to remove the candlestick, which means you won't be my church anymore. My Lord, could you imagine just because it says such and such church on the outside, it doesn't necessarily mean it's part of the body. He said, if you don't repent and turn back to me, I'll remove the candlestick. You'll no longer be a church of mine. You might still gather. You might still come together and sing, but you won't be a church of mine. Hallelujah. You won't any longer be a church of mine. If you don't go back to fulfilling the purpose of my church, I'll remove the candlestick. So we need to stop here for a moment because there, a lot of people go to church. A lot of people say they're in the church or the church is in them. We talk about being the church, but the, there is a purpose for his church and they were not fulfilling the purpose anymore. They were busy, yes, and a lot of people are busy, but are you pleasing to God? Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you doing it because you love the Lord or because you love recognition for yourself? You love, you love the recognition more than you love God, so you're no longer doing it because you love the Lord. You're doing it because you love notoriety. You love being patted on the back. You love hearing your name. You love hearing your name called out in the sanctuary more than calling out the name of Jesus. He said, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and remove my candlestick. What, what is God's purpose for the church? Well, five things I'll have to say. You need to write these down. We're talking about the church's purpose and Somehow, the Ephesian church had stepped away from purpose. But God's purpose for the church, God's purpose for the church, ministry, worship, fellowship, discipleship, mission. I'm going to say it again. I'll take my time. Ministry. The ministry. We should be evangelizing the community. If, if the church is there, been in the neighborhood for 20, 25 years, and nobody even knows you're a church, you've never been outside the doors, you've never fed the community, you've never witnessed to the community, you are not fulfilling the purpose of the church. No. What are y'all doing? What are we doing? Worship. We should be gathering together to worship. Yes, even during this pandemic, find a way to gather together to worship the name of your God. Fellowship, creating fellowship in the congregation. Now, fellowship and worship are two different things. In the worship, we come together to worship God. In fellowship, we come together to encourage and enrich one another. And it doesn't necessarily have to be out in the building but outside of the building. Now, one good thing about this pandemic, for lack of a better phrase, is that we've had to find new ways to come together, to evangelize, yeah, and even to perform worship, not just in the building. I think what it's done is showing us how, how to be the church without being in the building because we put so much emphasis on brick and mortar until we forget that we are the church. Discipleship, right? Disciple the committed, those who we win for Christ and those who are committed uh, to doing the work or the, to the purpose of the church. Disciple them, show them, pass it down, show them, right? A fisherman shows others how to fish. A teacher will show others how to accomplish this, yes. And then the mission. What is the mission? So it's ministry, worship, fellowship, discipleship. Mission is to equip 
the core or to equip those, right? Because every church, every congregation has a core. Those who are faithful to the ministry. You could have a million people who are who are on the roll, but you have a core of people who are doing the actual church ministry. And you equip the core for service and outreach. I don't want the work to die. I don't want us to lose our spirituality. So there is a core who will carry on the crux or the foundation of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So he says, you have left your first love. And I hear you saying, I, right? What, well, why are we talking about love? What does love have to do with it? Mm -hmm. I hear you. He said, you lost or you left, I should say, your first love. John, the Apostle John, he equates love with walking in the truth and keeping the commandments. So he's saying uh, you left your first love. You're no longer concerned about walking in the truth mm -hmm. and keeping the commandments. Let's go to 2 John, 2 John verse 6. 2 John verse 6, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. You have left your first love. Now, in 2 John, John is saying, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So they were no longer walking according to what they were taught. They were doing it their way. I'll do it the way I want. I've been doing it so long. I'm so proficient. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for 50 years. I got this. I got that. Now it's no longer about the Lord. It's about them. He said, but this is what love, this is love that you walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Don't change my word. Don't change the purpose or the reasoning for what you're doing. You're still, you should be doing it for me, not for you. All the glory and honor belongs to God. So this is love. So walking in the truth and keeping his commandments. So let's go back to the, the brief uh, conversation we had about false teaching or concerning the effect of false teachers. He warns. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things that we worked for. Be very careful. Don't let somebody come in and, and because it sounds good and you haven't fact checked it or word checked it, right? And they come in and take away everything you've been working for, right? We've been working for the Lord to be pleasing in his sight. And because we allowed someone to pull us away, or we even allowed our own concepts and opinions to pull us away. We're no longer doing it for the Lord. We're doing it, but it's not for the Lord. He says, look to yourselves. Second John, let's go to second John verses seven and eight. Second John verses seven. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. I'm going to start from verse 6. I read verse six earlier, but I want to read six, seven, and eight together. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So he said there are many deceivers and they are refusing to confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. They talk about everything else. They'll even try to convince you that Jesus Christ, God, did not wrap himself in flesh. 
He did not come in the likeness of sinful flesh. But the word of God says so, right? Um, years ago when I was a young man, uh, uh, for some reason, a lot of apostolic preachers were running uh, to tie themselves or to fellowship with uh, the Mooney Foundation, Reverend Sung Young Moon. I don't know if you remember them. Uh, they would stand out on the corner selling flowers, and we, we called them Moonies. But for quite some time, uh, a lot of these holiness preachers, right, they would go and fellowship uh, with the Moonies and um, go and do things, uh, banquets, services. And I, I um, we, we, are, we are taught to check does it measure up to the word of God? Not my opinion, not how I feel. And many of them were saying, well, there's no, there's no harm in it. But if you read the literature, if you read the literature, it says uh, almost on the first page where Sung Young Moon was saying that he is the Messiah. He's saying no scripture just plainly saying in his literature that he is the Messiah. Now, you know that's not true. And, and it, it bothered me. How can all of these apostolic or holiness preachers tie into someone who's claiming to be the Messiah? No, that's confusion. I know who the Messiah is. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. Now, Reverend Sung Young Moon is, has died. And his daughter has taken over the, the Mooney Foundation. He's taken over this, this reformation. Now, she claims to be the only daughter of God. The only daughter, the only begotten daughter of God. Think about that. What is she saying? She's made herself equal uh, a deity as if to say that she's she is the daughter of her father the only begotten daughter so she is a deity her father was the messiah now she's the messiah and a lot of preachers are tying themselves and you gotta you, we cannot tie ourselves or uh, mix ourselves with everything because everything is not true right so he says, look to yourselves. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for. We work for. This, this kind of person is a deceiver. And, and John says, and the Antichrist, watch yourselves. One, one translation says, watch yourselves so that you don't lose what we've worked for, but instead receive a full reward. In order for me to receive a full reward or reward for living holy, I have to stay in the holy place. And I can't mix anything with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in 3 John, he urges the church to serve the brethren and to become fellow workers of the truth. 3 John, I'm going to read it. Let's read it. Um. Third John, verses 4 through 8, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. So Jesus even emphasized humility, um, service, humility, right? I'll read it for you. Matthew 5 and 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
And in the gospel, according to St. John, chapter 15, verse number 12, this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. So Jesus is emphasizing in, in, in his ministry as he walked the earth, he emphasized humility and love for uh, our neighbor, uh, love for one another. Uh, and the church at the end of the first century contained individuals, though, um, who loved preeminence over others. And this is an attitude that the word of God uh, calls evil. Now, this had crept into the church by the end of the first century. Uh, we have individuals who loved preeminence or to lord over the people of God. Um, and it's an attitude, I'll repeat, that the Bible calls evil. Third John, verse number nine, verses nine through 11. Listen, uh, John writes, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not which is evil. Don't follow something that is evil. Follow people that try to make themselves appear to be more holy than others. And all they're really doing is creating division in my house. He said, don't follow them. Don't follow something that's evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Now, all of this is happening in the house of God, right? And, and so the word of God is saying, listen, there's a, there is a horrible attitude that has crept into the church, but you have people who now seek to have preeminence over others. And this attitude, the Bible calls evil. So let's let's get into this uh, because all of this happens uh, as a result of leaving your first love. So in order to discuss it in more detail, uh, we have to go back to, well, what did the church of Ephesus really lose by walking away from their first love. They actually, because they, they walked away somehow from their purpose, um, which means although they were calling themselves a church, somehow uh, they left their love for God. They didn't really love God the way they said they loved God because perhaps they started treating one another badly. You know, people are quick to say, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. And as soon as church is over, they mistreat their brothers and sisters. Well, if you love God, how can you love God whom you've never seen? And you don't even know how to love me and you see me all the time. So the church at Ephesus had lost its love for God. They had lost their love for the truth. They had lost their love for doing the work. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because my love for doing the work has to be about loving God and loving people. Not loving the accolades and the position and all that more. I have to love Jesus more. Right? So they had left their love for God, the truth, doing the work and the brethren. Yes, I've got to hasten on because I don't want to keep you all night. Well, um, in place of these fundamentals, people were listening to deceptive doctrines, right? And, and John makes reference to this, Revelation 2 and 6, but this thou hast that thou hatest, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So he gives them here a compliment because he said, there is something I discovered that you hate, and it is this false teaching that has come into the Ephesian church by the Nicolaitans. Now, um, the Nicolaitans had taken unto themselves 
a doctrine or a teaching that is closely related, or you may as well say it is the epitome of narcissism. Um, narcissism, yeah. Uh, the love of self, the love of self. Um, it is a, a sect or a clique that, it, that was started. And I, if you go back to the book of Acts, there were seven men that were chosen to be deacons. And there's one deacon by the name of Nikolai. Um, and it is believed historically, because he's mentioned in Acts, and now in Revelation, the Nicolaitans, he had started teaching a heresy that plagued the churches at Ephesus uh, and at Pergamum. Two churches were damaged by this teaching. Ephesus threw it out. So their issue wasn't this Nicolaitan teaching, but, but it was the fact that they had left their first love. Um, I'll throw out some names. Irenaeus, uh, who was a, a, a historian that wrote about church uh, issues, he identifies the Nicolaitans as a Gnostic, Gnostic sect. Right? John, the disciple of the Lord, preaches this faith and seeks by the proclamation of the gospel to remove that error. Uh, and there was a Jewish teacher by the name of Sermenthesis that plagued the church. And he was telling people, you don't have to adhere to all this stuff the apostles are telling you. Nope, just love yourself, love knowledge. Sounds familiar. Um, don't listen to the gospel. Just seek more knowledge. Mm -hmm. It was an error that was circulating among the men of the church, among the people in the church. Um, so now we have this term Nicolaitan. Um, hmm. It was an offset of just get all the knowledge you want and just deal with self, love self, love knowledge. Um, hmm. it, it was to persuade people. It was to persuade people to do things their own way. Um, and I wish I could dig as deeply as I, I, I want to, but time won't permit me. Um, but there was a Gnostic sect called Nicolaitans. Uh, and so, listen, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans appears to have been a form of antinomianism antinomianism is a belief that is based upon the recognition it recognizes the mercy of god listen it recognizes the mercy of god as the grounds of salvation but it makes a mistake and it says that men can freely partake in sin because the law of god is no longer binding so it says well because we're living under grace and the mercy of god we don't have to adhere to the law or the Ten Commandments. It's no longer binding, so we are free to sin. You can sin all you want to. The mercy of God covers you. It held the truth on the gratuity uh, of righteousness, right? The righteousness of God will uphold you. Do whatever you want. That's like giving you carte blanche to kill, to steal, uh, to fornicate, to commit adultery, um, and you'll still make it in. The law is no longer binding. It held it, it and well, and it calls this the truth, right? Hmm. James refutes this error in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19. He says, The devil believes and he trembles, right? And he reminds us, he's reminding us that true faith is an active principle which works by love and it goes beyond just saying, I'm saved, I'm saved. But putting it in action is living a holy and sanctified life. So although we don't live according to the Ten Commandments, the principles still apply, right? He says, I will, instead of writing my word on the tablet of stone, I will write it in your heart. So this is what James meant when he said, faith without works is dead. You can't just say I believe and not live a life 
that says, I believe. The Bible teaches us that salvation is a free gift based upon God's grace alone. However, the very next verse tells us that we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Jesus didn't fornicate, so he's, he did not save me to fornicate. Jesus wasn't an adulterer. He didn't save me to be an adulterer. Jesus didn't lie, cheat, and steal, and he didn't save me to lie, cheat, and steal. So everything Jesus ordained for me to walk in, that's what I should be walking in. True faith produces action or living holy, as well as a desire for holiness and obedience. And there's a plethora of scriptures I can give you, um, but I won't because it's going to take too much time. Uh, so it was a narcissistic doctrine, Gnosticism, love of oneself, right? Um, and to dig a little deeper in it, it's excessive interest in or admiration of self. Everything is about me, 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 me. Look at what I've done. Look at who I am, right? It's like the Lucifer syndrome. I, I'm going to sit up high. I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to take over. I don't want God to get the glory. Give it all to me. So it, it's admiration of oneself and one's even, even your physical appearance, right? And, and here are some other words that come into play when you think of uh the Nicolaitan teaching, um, self-love, self-admiration, self-adulation, self-absorption, self-obsession, conceit, self-conceit, self-centeredness, self-regard. There's a whole lot of self. I think this is an issue, even in the church today, is too much self, not enough Jesus. Hallelujah. We are to go back, go back to your first love, go back to Figure out where you fell. When did you start being so interested more in flesh than you were in whether or not we were pleasing God? Go back to that place and repent. And if we don't repent, he says, I'll come and remove my candlestick. Self-regard, egotism, egocentric, egomania, opposite. It is opposite from what Christ teaches us. He tells us that we should be modest, that we should, we should uh, consider our brothers uh, before we consider ourselves. There's, there's a psychology to this, to this teaching. Uh, it, it, it deals with selfless, selfishness, I'm sorry. It involves a sense of entitlement, hallelujah, a lack of empathy. So, uh, they may have been doing the work, but there was no love in the work they were doing. Let me explain, you know, because people brag about, well, we feed the, the hungry and we, we went out there. And, and I've, I listen, I've seen people in the street supposedly feeding people and, and they're being nasty to them. They're just doing it to do it, uh, you know, and, and they, they give them the, the sandwich and, even the person that's getting the sandwich looks at them and says, you want, they could tell when you're really doing it out of love. And, and you even made the sandwich like you could care less. <laughs> and, and we do things in the church with a sense of entitlement, no empathy, no sensitivity, uh, right? And you do it because you need to be admired, uh, to have a need for ad adoration, uh, and it's, it's a personality type if you dig into it. I have to be uh, in the limelight. Yes, we are the light, but the light that they should see is the light of Jesus Christ, not your light. I don't have the light. He is the light of the world, right? So if you, if you analyze it, psychoanalyze it, it, it deals with self-centeredness arising from failure to distinguish self from external objects, either in very, right? And, and it's something that people, people um, develop along the way, and you may need deliverance from that, where you have to be uh, the center of attention. 
Uh, but when we are saved, we are hid in Christ. My life has been hid in Christ. Uh, so these Nicolaitans, you could imagine, and there's more to this. There's more to this doctrine. Uh, and if I talked about it, um, it may offend some people, but this Nicolaitan doctrine, even when as far in, as, as into wife swapping and uh, doing different things, and they were doing it right in the house of God, you can live any way you want to live, right? Uh, and if you don't want your wife anymore, you can come over, go over there and get someone else's. And today we call that swinging. Uh, and all of this was happening, he said, and you have pushed that away. Um, you have denied that. Yet I still have an issue with you because you left your first love. Hmm. Which means there were some who were doing things just so they can get a particular position and they were holding on to position and that was more important than holding on to the truth right so they perhaps they were afraid to speak the truth because if i speak the truth you won't let me have this position anymore even today some are more concerned with holding a position uh, perhaps uh, you're serving as an elder or a deacon or, or president of an auxiliary right uh, and that means more to you than doing the work of God, right? Have you ever <laughs> have you ever seen people in church that do it, but you could tell they don't love nobody but themselves? That's what Jesus was talking about. You don't show love to nobody, but you got that position. You working in the church, but you don't love nothing but yourself. So what's your point, Bishop? And I'm coming to a close. My point is, should be clear. The lesson that the letter to the Ephesians uh, congregants is this. Get back on track. Number one, get back on track. Put that in a comment section. Get back on track. That's number one. This is what he's telling the Ephesian church. Get back on track. Number two, do the work. Do the work. The work of what? Do the work of the ministry. Do the work. Number two, put it in the comments section. Do the work. So get back on track. Do the work. Number three, preach the gospel with zeal. Preach the gospel with zeal. Hallelujah. There's no enthusiasm. And and, and I, I won't just say preach, but, but you're ministering in song. There's no love. There's no enthusiasm. Uh, you just you're just doing it to be doing it, uh, and people can tell. Where is your zeal? What happened to your zeal? People were able to tell how you love the Lord and you love the people you were ministering to. Now you're throwing the song at us, Hallelujah, my Lord. Love the truth. That's number four. So let's go back. Get back on track do the work, preach the gospel with zeal. Number four, love the truth. And the last one, love each other. Stop telling people how much you love the Lord and you don't show love to nobody. Love each other. So here's my final thought and I'm getting ready to close. Um, the New Testament church I have in my notes, the New Testament church, which began uh, in the 30s AD, was beginning to fragment by, by the time we get to the 90s AD. And John writes his epistles in the book of Revelation. And the Apostle Paul indicates that this diversity of opinion had been present for some time, Right? Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, 
that there are contentions among you. Now, contention is a little stronger than division. Contentions mean not only are you divided, but you got an attitude with one another. Now, this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am Apollos, I of Cephas, I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? And, and, and this kind of division or divisiveness was causing people to fall away. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 1.15 This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Now where are we at? In Revelation. And we're dealing with the seven churches in Asia Minor. And it's also prophetic, and it applies to the church today. It also, I said in the beginning, represents different errors of the church. So I'll start again. Second Timothy 1.15, This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. He mentions two men, uh, Phygelus, Phygelus, I'm sorry, and Homogenes. Hmm. Now, um, by the 60s, and when I say the 60s, 60s AD, uh, I should say in just a little over 60 years, the church founded by Christ, it was rife, which means it was plentiful division and uh, doctrinal strife. You, even back then, there was so many doctrines circulating, so many teachings circulating, just like today. But here he mentions two men in particular, Phygelus. Uh, and the, pronoun the, the correct pronunciation is Fugilus. Um, and Fugilus, you can say Fugilus if you want. Um, his name means uh, a little fugitive. <laughs> and Hermogenes, his name means lucky born. Uh, and, and there are about 34 people that Paul mentions when he writes about people who either helped him or were hindrance or tried to be a hindrance to the ministry. Uh, but these two men, they started out following Paul in the gospel, uh, but then they turned against him in the church. They turned away from following Paul and the, and the gospel. Um, and he mentions them. So they, they must have really agitated his spirit, right? Um, listen to, to this. This thou knowest, it's the scripture again, that they all which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. And um, hmm. they turned against him, and they were creating division in the house. So this is why by the time he gets, when he gets to the Philippian congregations, he says, mark them, which walk so as they... Um, I'll read it the way it says, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so. So mark those who are walking in the truth, not those who are walking in lies or those who have turned away from the truth. Don't allow people who don't want to live right to influence you. Let the truth influence you. I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm going to stop here. We're going to dig deeper into this, into these letters. I don't want to keep you uh, too much longer because I want you to come back. Um, but this is the message uh, that the Lord wants us to hear tonight. Let's get back on track. Mm -hmm. Get back on track. Let's do things so we can be pleasing in the sight of God, not for our own fleshly desires, but so that we might be found pleasing in the sight of God and because we love the Lord and our love for God is shown by the love that we show to others. So let's go back, get back on track. 
do the work, preach the gospel with zeal, love the truth, and love each other. If we don't repent, if we don't turn back to the purpose that he saved us and the purpose behind us being the church, he says, I'll come and remove the candlestick. It is possible for folks to come together and have church and not even realize that they're no longer in the church. <laughs> I hear that song, are you in the church triumphant? I want to stay in the church. I want to continue to be his bride. And I want to do it because I love him. I don't want to walk away from this love. Have you ever been in love? I mean, seriously, have you ever been so in love that you can't stop thinking of, about that name? That name is always coming out of your mouth. Right. We should love Jesus even more that we can't stop saying his name. Can't stop singing about him can't stop thinking about him and everything we do is because we love him and because we love him there's no problem showing love to others everything I do people should be able to feel the love everything you do people should be able to feel the love of Christ father in the name of your son Jesus Christ I've shared tonight what you have given me to share it's not too late for us to fall in love again, to do it for the right reason. Sing for the right reason. Preach for the right reason. Hallelujah. Serve for the right reason. Help us, Lord. Help us, Father. We repent for being so self-serving and self-absorbed. We repent for doing it only for notoriety and so that people can say, Oh God, how well we looked and what we did. We want to do it to please you. You get all the glory. Hallelujah. Help us, oh God, to be the church that you're looking for in these last and evil days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you tonight. Thank you so much for this time, allowing me this time to come into your homes and automobiles. If you have a special need of prayer, a special request, make it known to us. Send it admin at grtdc.org. And I'll lay that request on the altar as I pray during the week and touching and agreeing with you. God answers prayer. If you want to plant a seed in this ministry, you want to pay your tithes, you may do that. A technician will put that on the bottom of the screen. And those of you who are fellowshipping, who have tapped in from the annex, you may use Givelify, or as they pass the basket, you can give. But your tithes are given this offering to be a blessing to the ministry. Well, the Lord bless you, and um, we'll come back with part two. This is a seven-part series and uh, entitled, A Letter from Jesus. Let's see what the letter says next week. Until then, be careful, be prayerful, be holy. Shalom, shalom.